The last few weeks, uh, we've been in the prayer that Jesus prayed just before his arrest. A prayer made on the brink of his passion, a prayer that demonstrated his passion for his followers as he went to the Father on behalf of the terrified group nearby and all of us. The group who first heard that prayer would go on to first betray him and then on to build the church, which we're part of now. Last week, we saw how his concern was not just for them, but for us, the harvest of their work and the many generations of faithful witnesses in between. And his prayer showed us a few things. It showed us his compassion, his love for us and for his disciples, the ones that were standing around him, his sense of himself, his sense of purpose in the world, and his understanding of God the Father. How we pray shows what we believe about ourselves, about God, and about the world. And we saw that in his prayer in John 17. We saw Jesus pray out of his identity and relationship with God as Father, his identity as God's Son. We saw him pray in a way that showed his belief in God's ability to glorify him, even through the suffering, the horrible, gruesome death that was ahead of him and about his ability, Jesus' ability, to give eternal life to those who believed in him. We saw Jesus pray as though believing in him did something to the disciples, to those who believed, so that they no longer fit into the world, they were no longer part of the world, and they became like him in some way. They became part of his world. And last week, in the last part of the prayer, we saw how deeply loved we are. Because when we believe, when we put our faith in Jesus, we become like Jesus, God's children. And we share in the love between God the Father and God the Son. So as we come to look at this really familiar prayer, I have a few questions just for you to keep in mind. Do we pray with a clear sense of our identity and of who God is? Chris um, quoted from Hebrews 4 earlier about approaching the throne of God with confidence. Do we pray as if we have the right to approach God with confidence? With a sense of what God can do? That he can actually still the storms in our lives, as Kerry was sharing with the children? What is our expectation when we come to God in prayer? Do we pray with humility, with gratitude, with generosity? with compassion, looking at the world, not just at ourselves and our own problems. So there's a few questions there for you to be holding, giving you some work to do today. And I want to suggest that the Lord's Prayer teaches us who we are and who God is. It it has to be one of the most well-known prayers, pieces of scripture, anywhere. It appears here in Matthew's Gospel, and also in Luke's Gospel. In Luke's Gospel, it's presented as an answer to a question from the disciples who asked Jesus, how how then should we pray? Teach us to pray, and this, this is given as his response. But here in Matthew, it's part of Jesus' longest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. If you have it in front of you, can someone give me the page reference? You might You might need this, I'm just warning you. Uh, He introduces it as a given, 787, page 787. So in verse 5, where we start today, he introduces prayer as a given, saying, not if you pray, but when you pray. So we should be doing this all the time, shouldn't we? This should just be a normal thing that we do as believers. I won't ask you how often you pray, because that would be rude. But hopefully the question is how often and not how rarely do you pray. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he tells them to pray at all times with thanksgiving. The book of Psalms is a 150 chapter prayer book, essentially. And all through scripture, we see how prayer changes things. Battles are turned around through prayer. Barren women conceive when they come to God in prayer. Flocks of birds fly into the desert to feed a nation after prayer. 
A boy's lunch feeds a multitude of people after a prayer of thanksgiving. And I'm sure that many of you will have examples of answered prayer that you can share. Maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps over the, the delightful tea and coffee afterwards. Don't do it now. The point is that prayer moves God. Prayer changes things. Prayer is effective. So given how famous this prayer is, I'm going to ask you to help me keep on track this morning, or stay awake, depending on what your state of mind is. So, how does it start? Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thank you. Gosh, this is going to be hard work today. The very opening, the very opening line sets the tone. Children speak to fathers. This is not a formal, distant, religious thing. In the very first line, Jesus invites us to come close. Children coming with a request. In John 17, which we've been looking at, which you probably should all know very well by now, Jesus calls God Father, over and over again. Father, and then righteous Father, and then holy Father. And holy is what hallowed means. Hallowed be your name. And what he's saying here is, may your name be the most respected, honoured thing. Uh, I shared with you in previous weeks that God's name is not just his name. It's not just a name. It stands for who he is. It stands for his character his nature, his ways, his reputation. We all understand that, don't we? Name means the same thing now, doesn't it? And you'll remember from John 17 that Jesus gave his disciples his own name, Jesus, which means God saves. It's another name that they were given for God. So what's the next line? Keep going. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. You're very shy, aren't you? Wow. You Anglicans, come on. So this father whose name is to be honoured has a kingdom which we're asking to come. You hear about the kingdom a lot in Mark's gospel. In fact, Jesus' opening words are to announce that the kingdom of God is near. Back in John 17, you'll see I keep referring to John 17. Jesus prayed for God to glorify him, and we pray for God to glorify, to be glorified in these lines of this prayer when we ask for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is where God is fully manifest, fully present. It's the extent of his authority James tells us that God lives in unapproachable light. But the earth is in rebellion against God, and his rule is contested, isn't it? It's denied, it's ignored. And so we pray as believers for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done, for God to be glorified here. God's kingdom also reflects God's character So as we pray for his kingdom to come, we are praying for justice. We're praying for mercy. We're praying for compassion. We're praying for provision for those in need. We're praying for advocacy and support for the weak, to be voices for those who cannot speak for themselves. And just as Jesus prays, not my will but yours, So we pray for God's will to be done and we align ourselves with Jesus' obedience instead of the rebellion of Adam and Eve and every generation that's followed. Okay, loud and clear. What's the next line? That's more like it. Give us today our daily bread. God is our provider. We have nothing, own nothing, can do nothing, have achieved nothing that God did not either provide to us directly or make possible for us. And so, in humility, we ask for God to provide for our, for our needs, recognizing that we are vulnerable and we're unable to live without his provision. 
practically or spiritually. In John 6, Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. And he offers himself to us as that. That's what we remember each time we take communion. That we are spiritually dead without the life of Jesus, which comes to us through our faith in him. Next slide. So it's interesting how different translations have this. Um, in the Greek, it, the word is debt, actually. Um, and in the, the old-fashioned version, it's our trespasses. I'm just going to take it in two sections. Forgive us out. I'll call them sins to begin with. We who live on this side of the resurrection know that our sins are forgiven. Now, it would be great to live without being affected by sin, to think, well, we're done with sin. We don't sin anymore. But if you're anything like me, the first hour of every day proved to me that this is not my reality. Sometimes the first five minutes, actually. Now, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily you know, kicking the cat down the stairs, but often our behavior does not match where we think we ought to be. And we acknowledge this in our weekly confession, which, as any of you know, who've been here with me for a while, I really love the confession because I just get to like, okay. And that's what we're doing in this section of the prayer. We're admitting that we are prone to wander. That word trespass, which we come across in the King James Version of this prayer, speaks to one of the translations of sin in the Old Testament, which actually means to wander off the path, to go the wrong way. Or to miss the mark is another translation. And the word, of, the word debt, which is what we see in, the, in this version, reminds us we owe God our obedience. However we remember this word or how we've learnt this word in this prayer, the fact is that we all need forgiveness. And that's why we need to ask for it. And we can ask for it because our God is a forgiving God. It is the, dis the distinctive of our faith. The reason that Jesus went through the horrible death that he went through was to secure our forgiveness. We live in an unforgiving world, don't we? A single mistake can blight a life. I think that's more true now than it has ever been. It used to be that, you know, you might have an indiscretion in your youth and maybe no one would ever find out. But now, thanks to the internet, there is a permanent record. Unforgiveness, grudges can lead to feuds between families, among communities, wars between nations. We need forgiveness, don't we? But there's nowhere to get it in this life without God. Knowing that we can come to God for pardon and know that God removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, according to Psalm 103, is a gift that comes to us uniquely through Christ. And it is literally life-saving. So we ask to God to forgive us our sins or our debts or our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us. Now occasionally we hear of a very heroic Christian publicly forgiving some awful, awful thing like a person who's killed a family member or similar. And if you're anything like me, you're like, oh, I wish I would be able to do that. But, but the truth is that this is the ethic that God calls us to live by. And it does make us look like idiots in the eyes of the world, or uncaring, or a bit dim, or delusional. But that's the way we're meant to live. We have no right to hold unforgiveness when God has forgiven us. And in fact, our forgiveness is in question when we hold on to our grudges. 
point so important that Jesus repeats it at the end of the prayer in verse 15 of our passage. As the scholar Liam Morris points out, this, this has to be an aspiration, not a limitation on our prayers. Because how many of us pass that test? How many of us can really say we've never held a grudge? It's, if nothing else, a word to keep us humble and to remind us to check our own hearts for unforgiveness before we ask it of God. Okay, now, last line, nice and loud. <laughs> Thank you. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I always found this line a bit cheeky. Like, can we ask God stuff like that? Is that like asking for parking spaces or for my team to win, whichever team that is? And I did find some controversy among the scholars about this. asking whether God deliberately tempts us or not. They quoted the story of Job and Abraham and Isaac, which I commend to your reading, as examples of God putting people to the test. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 speaks about God providing a landing place, a way of escape through temptation. But uh, I climbed out of the weeds of all of that um, with this idea from a scholar who called Michael Knowles who sees this as something much simpler as a humble admission that we are not spiritual giants who could withstand any test so we're essentially saying please just, please just spare us that because we know we're not up to it as I said it always seemed a bit cheeky seemed a bit like a bit of a cop out kind of line in this prayer but here it is. Jesus puts it in. So we can pray this. God is open to our honest prayers, to our, I don't know that I can handle this, so please could you just spare me kind of prayers. We're to come to him with all kinds of prayers and all kinds of situations. Because this prayer is not, it's not a formula to recite. It's an example of the kind of honest conversation you can have with God, understanding who you are, who God is, You can talk to him like this. Prayer is dynamic. It's a conversation. God answers. God responds. He wants us to engage with him. Not as we think we ought to be, all tidied up and proper with our church faces on and our ducks in a row, but as we actually are. Fallible, weak, needy, a bit slow sometimes, or hesitant, or headstrong, depending on our personalities but always as his beloved children because we believe in his beloved son. You can see that in the first part of our passage in verse, verses five to eight. Jesus gives us a list of don'ts that strip the performance element out of prayer. Don't be fake, he says. The word hypocrite, which I'm sure we've all heard. If you've been a Christian for five minutes, you'll have heard the word hypocrite aimed at you or at the church is the word for actor. Don't play act. Be real. Speak to him properly. It's not a religious performance. It's not a superstitious ritual. It's real communication in real time with someone who is really listening. Pray as if he is really listening. Because he really is. He knows you. He's ahead of you. He knows what you need before you even ask him for it, and he's waiting to hear from you. Like a parent of a young child, and let's face it, even the oldest ones of us here are mere babes in God's eyes. A parent knows what a child needs before the child knows, and delights to see the child realize that they can provide this need. And they delight to see the child come to them to ask for it. Many of us here will have learnt this prayer by heart as children. And I deliberately did this in a bit of a Sunday school way, just to 
bring us back to the simplicity of this prayer and the simplicity of our relationship with God. And it's good, I think, to remind ourselves of what this prayer actually means and implies about us and about God and what a great model it is for us to follow. The theme of prayer is very important for all of us. It's not just something that Chris and I do or particular people that you know who are good at praying. It's how we communicate with God on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, particularly when things are difficult. And he wants to hear from us. I want to encourage you to look back at this prayer in your own time and also to have another read of John 17 and savour the fact that Jesus taught us to pray and showed us how to pray, not just to, a, not to some distant deity, but to God who describes himself, identifies himself as Father and wants us to draw near. Last week, I invited you to ponder the miracle of God's amazing love for Jesus being extended to those of us who believe in him. And this week, I'm inviting you to take action. It's not either or. You don't have to stop pondering this amazing thing. It's kind of an ongoing. If you take a look at the Psalms, which I said before were like Israel's prayer book, you see a shift between praise and petition, between thanksgiving and making requests, pouring out sorrow or frustration or pain, remembering when God's answered prayers in the past. And this, this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, models that kind of open relationship with God where you can come to him in your weakness and acknowledge it before him. So the, the thing I would love you to, to think about doing as I come to the end of this message today is to just stretch a little, whatever you're doing, if you don't pray, or not very often, just pray a bit more. If you pray alone, maybe find a friend to pray with. We have a regular prayer meeting on a Monday morning at 8 o'clock over Zoom. The link is on our website. You might want to join us. We're very friendly. I'm going to trial another prayer meeting over Zoom as well for those of you who find 8 o'clock on a Monday morning a bit, a bit too much, uh, which will be on a Thursday lunchtime, midday, and the link will be on the website. I ran a prayer course here last year, and I'm aiming to run another one at the beginning of next year. We have lots of resources. There are lots of people here who you will know are prayers. Talk to them. I have books that you can borrow. I'm sure Chris has books that you can borrow on prayer as well. Prayer is not just a nice to have. It's essential. It's like breathing. We need to be in communication with God. For the things that we want to do in our own lives, the things that we want to do as a church, as a parish, prayer is essential. And we're so blessed that Jesus taught us himself how to do it and modeled it for us. So I encourage you to stretch in prayer this coming week. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you expect and invite us to pray. Teach us to draw near expectantly and confidently more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.